Warning, the following stories you are about to hear are truly disturbing. Make sure to subscribe or I will come for you. I explored an underground abandoned ruin and we awakened something. Hey everyone, first time posting here. I need to get this off my chest. I've been carrying this weight for too long and maybe sharing it will help me sleep at night. This happened last summer and it's haunted me every day since. It all started with a trip. My friends and I have always been into exploring abandoned places, old factories, ghost towns, you name it. So when we heard about an underground ruin just a few hours from our hometown, we jumped at the chance. The place was supposedly an old military bunker from the Cold War, hidden deep in the woods. No official records of it existed, which made it all the more intriguing. There were four of us, me, Jake, my best friend Tom, his girlfriend Lisa, and our mutual friend Eric. Tom and Lisa are the adventurous types, always up for anything. Eric is more cautious, but has a knack for finding these hidden gems. He's the one who found the bunker, piecing together old maps and rumors from local forums. We packed our gear, flashlights, batteries, some food and water, standard stuff for a day trip. The drive to the forest was uneventful, just the usual banter and excitement about what we might find. When we got to the edge of the woods, we parked and hiked for about an hour before we found the entrance. It was exactly where Eric said it would be, a rusted metal hatch, half buried under a tangle of roots and vines. It took us a good while to get it open. The hinges were stiff with rust, and the air that wafted out was stale and cold. We could see a ladder leading down into the darkness. Tom, ever the fearless leader, volunteered to go first. He clipped a flashlight to his belt and started descending. Lisa followed, then Eric, and finally, me. The ladder went down a long way. The deeper we went, the colder it got. By the time my feet touched the ground, I was shivering. The room we'd found ourselves in was small, with concrete walls and a low ceiling. The only way out was a narrow corridor leading further into the bunker. We moved single file, with Tom in the lead. The corridor was lined with old electrical conduits and broken light fixtures. Our footsteps echoed eerily in the confined space. After about ten minutes, we reached a larger room what looked like an old control center. There were rusted consoles, smashed monitors, and papers scattered everywhere. We split up to explore. Eric started going through the papers, hoping to find some clue about what this place was. Lisa was fascinated by an old map on the wall, trying to make sense of the faded markings. Tom and I checked out the consoles, but they were all dead. Then Tom found something strange. In the corner of the room, hidden behind a fallen shelf was another hatch. This one was newer, made of reinforced steel. It looked completely out of place, like it had been added later. There was a keypad next to it, but it had no power. What do you think's down there? Tom asked, his voice echoing slightly in the empty room. No idea, I replied, but it looks like someone went to a lot of trouble to keep it sealed. By this point, Lisa and Eric had joined us. We decided to try and open the hatch. Eric fiddled with the keypad, but without power, it was useless. Tom, being the brute force guy, suggested we try to pry it open. We took turns hitting it with a crowbar, but it barely budged. Frustrated, we started searching the room for anything that might help. That's when Lisa found the generator. It was tucked away in a small alcove 
behind some debris. Surprisingly, it looked like it was in decent shape. Eric tinkered with it for a bit and managed to get it running. The lights flickered to life, casting long shadows across the room. With the generator running, the keypad on the hatch lit up. We gathered around as Eric punched in a few random codes. Nothing happened. We were about to give up when Lisa noticed something on the wall, a small plaque with a series of numbers. She suggested we try them, and to our surprise, the hatch clicked open. We all stared at each other for a moment, a mix of excitement and apprehension on our faces. Tom was the first to move, pulling the hatch open to reveal another ladder descending into darkness. This time, the air that rose up was different, warmer, and carrying a faint, unpleasant smell. One by one, we climbed down. This ladder was shorter, and we quickly found ourselves in another corridor, this one even narrower than the first. The walls were lined with strange symbols, like nothing I'd ever seen before. They were painted in a dark, reddish-brown color that made my skin crawl. The corridor ended in a large, circular chamber. The floor was covered in a thick layer of dust, and the air felt heavy, oppressive. In the center of the room was a pedestal with a strange object on it. A small, ornate box covered in intricate carvings. Tom, always the curious one, approached the pedestal. As he reached out to touch the box, Lisa grabbed his arm. Maybe we shouldn't mess with this, she said, her voice trembling slightly. Tom brushed her off. It's just an old box, he said, lifting it off the pedestal. That's when everything went to hell. As soon as the box left the pedestal, a low rumbling sound filled the chamber. The symbols on the walls began to glow, casting an eerie red light. The floor started to shake, and the air grew even thicker. We all looked at each other in panic, unsure what to do. Tom tried to put the box back, but it was too late. The rumbling grew louder, and the ground beneath our feet began to crack. We heard a sound like a distant wail, growing closer and more intense. The walls seemed to pulse with an unnatural energy. Run, Eric shouted, and we bolted back toward the ladder. As we scrambled up, the chamber behind us erupted in a deafening roar. I glanced back and saw something rising from the floor, something dark and formless, with eyes that glowed like embers. We made it back to the control room, slamming the hatch shut behind us. The generator sputtered and died, plunging us into darkness. The only light came from our flashlights, casting frantic beams as we tried to find our way back to the surface. The bunker seemed to be alive, the walls groaning and shifting around us. We could hear that wailing sound now accompanied by a chorus of whispers, as if the very air was filled with voices. We stumbled through the corridors, our hearts pounding in our chests. Finally, we reached the ladder leading up to the entrance. One by one, we climbed out gasping for the fresh air. As soon as we were all out, we slammed the hatch shut and piled rocks and debris on top of it desperate to seal whatever we had unleashed back inside. We didn't speak much on the hike back to the car. The forest, which had seemed so peaceful before, now felt hostile, the shadows hiding unseen dangers. When we finally reached the car, we drove in silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those glowing eyes, heard those whispers. I still do. We haven't talked about what happened since that day. Tom and Lisa broke up. Eric moved away, and I...
I can't shake the feeling that something followed us out of that bunker. I don't know what we awakened down there, but I'm terrified it's not done with us yet. Hey everyone, thanks for all the comments and messages. I didn't expect such a response. Some of you wanted to know more, so here's the next part of the story. Things got a lot worse after that day. After we got back, we all tried to move on with our lives, but something had changed. It was like we were marked. Tom, Lisa, Eric, and I hardly spoke anymore. We used to be inseparable, but now even being in the same room felt unbearable. It was like the air around us was charged with something sinister. The first sign that things weren't right came about a week after our trip. I woke up in the middle of the night to a sound in my apartment. At first I thought it was just the old pipes or maybe a neighbor, but then I heard it again, whispering. It was faint, almost like the wind, but definitely whispering. I couldn't make out any words, but it sent chills down my spine. I got out of bed and walked around my apartment, trying to find the source. The whispering seemed to be everywhere and nowhere at once. I checked the windows, the doors, even the closets, but there was nothing. After a while, the sound faded, and I managed to convince myself it was just my imagination. But it wasn't just me. The next day, Tom called me, his voice shaky. Have you... have you noticed... Anything weird? He asked. I hesitated, not wanting to sound crazy. But when I told him about the whispering, he went silent for a moment. I've heard it too, he finally said, and that's not all. Lisa's been having nightmares. She says she sees those eyes every time she closes her eyes. That night I had my first nightmare. I was back in the bunker standing in that circular chamber. The walls were glowing with those strange symbols, and the air was thick with whispers. I tried to move, but I was frozen in place. Then the pedestal started to crack open, and something black and formless began to rise from it. Those glowing eyes locked onto mine, and I woke up screaming. The nightmares continued, every night more vivid and terrifying than the last. Each time, the entity in my dreams seemed closer, more defined. I started avoiding sleep, drinking coffee, and energy drinks to stay awake. But it wasn't just the dreams that were getting worse. One night, about two weeks after our trip, I was sitting in my living room, trying to distract myself with TV. Suddenly, all the lights in my apartment flickered and went out. The TV screen turned to static, and the whispering started again, louder this time. I felt a cold breeze brush past me, and for a moment, I could swear I saw a shadow move across the room. I grabbed my flashlight and shone it around, but there was nothing. The lights came back on, and the TV returned to normal. I was shaking, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew then that Whatever we had awakened wasn't just in our heads. It was real, and it was coming for us. Desperate, I called Eric. He sounded worse than I felt. Jake, we need to do something, he said. I've been doing some research. There are legends about places like that bunker, places where ancient entities were sealed away. We need to go back and find a way to seal it again. Going back to that place was the last thing I wanted to do, but Eric was right. We had to try. I called Tom and Lisa, and they reluctantly agreed to join us. We met up a few days later, armed with everything we could think of. Salt, holy water, crosses, even a book of rituals Eric had found online. The hike to the bunker felt longer this time. The forest darker and more foreboding. When we reached the hatch, we found the rocks and debris we'd piled on top scattered around. The hatch was open, a gaping maw 
leading into the darkness below. We exchanged nervous glances, but there was no turning back now. We had descended into the bunker, the oppressive air wrapping around us like a shroud. The corridors seemed to have shifted, the walls now covered in even more of those disturbing symbols. We made our way back to the control room, and from there to the second hatch. The circular chamber looked exactly as I remembered it, but now the pedestal was broken in half and the box was gone. The air was thick with a scent of decay, and the whispers were louder, almost deafening. Oh, we formed a circle following the ritual Eric had found. As we began to chant, the ground started to shake, and the whispers turned into wails. The entity began to rise from the floor, its glowing eyes locking onto each of us. The temperature plummeted, our breath visible in the cold air. I felt a pressure in my head, like something was trying to get inside. The ritual seemed to be working, but the entity was fighting back. Suddenly, Tom collapsed, clutching his head and screaming. The rest of us tried to keep chanting, but the entity's power was overwhelming. Lisa was next, dropping to her knees, her eyes rolling back into her head. Eric and I tried to finish the ritual, but the ground beneath us cracked open and a wave of darkness surged up, enveloping us. I don't remember much after that. I woke up outside the bunker, alone. My head was pounding, and my body felt like it had been through a meat grinder. I stumbled to my feet and looked around, but there was no sign of Tom, Lisa, or Eric. I made my way back to town, my mind racing with questions. What had happened? Where were my friends? And most importantly, had we sealed the entity back in the bunker, or was it still out there, hunting us? I've been trying to find answers, but I'm not sure I want to know the truth. Every night the nightmares return, and the whispers never truly stop. I can't escape the feeling that something is watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I'm scared. Scared that whatever we awakened is still out there. Scared that it's only a matter of time before it finds me. And scared that I might be the only one left who can stop it. I've been debating whether or not to continue this story. Writing it down makes it all feel too real but I guess there's no turning back now. Here is part three. After that night, my life became a waking nightmare. I moved to a new apartment, hoping a change of scenery would help, but the whispers followed me. No matter where I went, they were there, just at the edge of my hearing, like a faint breeze rustling leaves. I knew I wasn't alone, Whatever we had awakened was still with me. I tried reaching out to Tom, Lisa, and Eric, but they had all vanished. Their phones were disconnected and their apartments were empty. It was like they'd never existed. I even went to the police, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Without any evidence, they dismissed my story. It says the ravings of a paranoid mind. Days turned into weeks, and my grip on reality began to slip. The nightmares grew worse. Each night, I'd find myself back in that chamber, facing the entity. Its glowing eyes burned into my soul, and its whispers grew louder, more insistent. They were no longer just noises. They were words, twisted and malevolent, promising pain and, and suffering. One night, as I lay in bed, Exhausted but too afraid to sleep, I felt a cold hand brush against my arm. I jolted upright, my heart pounding. The room was dark, but I could see a shadowy figure standing at the foot of my bed. It was tall and thin, with those same glowing eyes staring at me. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. The figure moved closer, its whispers filling my mind. I could feel its breath on my face cold and rancid. It leaned in, 
its eyes inches from mine, and I heard it speak clearly for the first time. Return. Then it was gone. The room was empty, but the ter terror remained. I knew what it wanted. It wanted me to go back to the bunker. I had no idea why, but I couldn't shake the feeling that my friends' lives depended on it. The next morning, I packed a bag with supplies and drove back to the forest. The journey felt surreal, like I was moving through a dream. When I reached the edge of the woods, I hesitated. Every instinct told me to turn back, to forget about the bunker and the horrors within. But I couldn't. I had to know what had happened to my friends. The hike to the bunker was different this time. The forest was eerily silent, the trees looming like sentinels. I reached the hatch and found it open, just as I had left it. Taking a deep breath, I descended the ladder, the whispers growing louder with each step. The bunker felt even more oppressive than before. The walls seemed to pulse with a dark energy, and the air was thick with the scent of decay. I made my way to the control room, then to the second hatch. The circular chamber was just as I remembered it, but now it was filled with a dark, swirling mist. In the center of the room, where the pedestal had been, stood the entity. It was more defined now, its form shifting and writhing like smoke. Its eyes locked onto mine and the whispers intensified. Return said again, its voice echoing in my mind. I didn't know what it wanted me to do. I had no idea how to stop it, but I had to try. I reached into my bag and pulled out the book of rituals Eric had found. Flipping through the pages, I searched for something, anything, that might help. The entity moved closer, its form stretching and elongating. I could feel its malevolent presence pressing down on me, threatening to crush my sanity. My hand shook as I found a ritual that seemed promising, an exorcism meant to banish dark entities. I started chanting, my voice trembling. The words felt foreign and strange, but I forced myself to continue. The entity recoiled, its eyes narrowing. The ground began to shake, and the whispers turned into screams. The mist swirled around me, and I could feel a pressure building in my chest. It was like the entity was trying to rip me apart from the inside. I kept chanting, the words blending together in a frantic rush. The entity lashed out, its form twisting and convulsing. Just as I thought I couldn't take any more, there was a blinding flash of light. The entity let out a final ear-piercing scream and dissolved into the mist. The ground stopped shaking, and the whispers faded into silence. I collapsed, gasping for breath. The chamber was empty. The oppressive weight lifted. I had done it. I had banished the entity. But as I looked around, I realized that my friends were still nowhere to be found. I stumbled back to the surface, my mind a haze of confusion and exhaustion. The forest felt different now, the air lighter and more welcoming. I made my way back to my car and drove home, hoping that the nightmare was finally over. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. The entity might be gone, but the darkness it had brought into my life remained. I still hear the whispers, sometimes faint and distant, and every now and then I catch a glimpse of those glowing eyes in the shadows. I don't know what happened to Tom, Lisa, and Eric. Maybe they're still out there, trapped in some dark dimension, or maybe the entity took them somewhere beyond my reach. All I know is that I have to keep fighting, to keep searching for answers. Because if I don't, I fear that the darkness will consume me too. Hey everyone, I appreciate all the support and concern. 
This has been a hellish journey, but knowing people are out there reading this gives me some strength. Here's part four. After banishing the entity, things seemed to calm down a bit. The whispers were less frequent. The nightmares not as vivid. But the unease never left me. I knew my friends were out there somewhere, and I couldn't just abandon them. So, I began to research everything I could about ancient entities, dark rituals, and the occult. My days were spent in libraries, poring over old books and manuscripts. I scoured the internet, diving into forums and websites dedicated to the supernatural. It was exhausting and often led to dead ends, but I couldn't stop. I had to find something, anything, that could help me understand what we had unleashed and how to find my friends. One night, I came across an old forum post. It was buried deep in a thread about abandoned places and haunted sites. The user, who had posted years ago, mentioned a similar experience to mine finding a hidden underground site, disturbing something ancient, and losing friends to the darkness. My heart raced as I read through the post. The details were eerily similar, right down to the glowing eyes and the whispers. I messaged the user, hoping they were still active. To my surprise, they responded within an hour. They went by the username Shadow Seeker, and claimed to have been investigating these kinds of phenomena for years. We chatted for hours, and Shadow Seeker revealed they had encountered several sites like the one we found, each linked to a different entity. According to them, these sites were part of an ancient network designed to contain and control malevolent forces. Shadow Seeker agreed to help me. They provided me with more information about the entities and the network of sites. According to their research, each entity was bound to a specific location by a powerful artifact, similar to the box we had found. Destroying the artifact would weaken the entity, but it had to be done correctly, or it could backfire and unleash even more chaos. We arranged to meet in person, Shadow Seeker lived a few states away, so I packed my things and drove to their location. It was a long drive, filled with a mix of hope and dread. Meeting someone who understood what I was going through was a relief, but I couldn't shake the fear of what we might discover. When I arrived, Shadow Seeker greeted me with a wary smile. They were older than I expected, with a weathered face and eyes that had seen too much. We sat down in their cluttered living room, surrounded by books, maps, and strange artifacts. Shadow Seeker explained that they had been tracking these entities for decades. They believed that the artifacts, like the box we found, were the keys that could either bind or release the entities. Our goal was to find the artifact linked to the entity we had awakened and destroy it in a specific ritual. Only then could we hope to free my friends and end this nightmare. We spent the next few days preparing. Shadow Seeker had a map of similar sites and believed the closest one might hold the answers we needed. We packed our gear, flashlights, food, water, and the ritual book Eric had found. Shadow Seeker also brought some items of their own, a silver dagger, a vial of blessed water, and a strange rune-covered amulet. The journey to the next site was grueling. It was located in a remote mountain range, far from any signs of civilization. The hike took us through dense forests and rugged terrain, and every step felt like we were being watched. The oppressive feeling from the first bunker was back, stronger than ever. When we finally reached the site, it was similar to the first, a rusted hatch hidden among the rocks. We pried it open 
and descended into the darkness. The air was cold and stale, the walls lined with more of those disturbing symbols. Shadowseeker led the way, their flashlight casting long shadows as we moved deeper into the underground complex. We reached a large chamber, similar to the one I had seen before. In the center stood a pedestal, but this time the artifact was a twisted blackened skull covered in the same intricate carvings as the box. The sight of it made my skin crawl. Shadowseeker began the ritual, chanting in a language I didn't recognize. The air grew thick, and the walls seemed to vibrate with an otherworldly energy. As they chanted, I felt a pressure in my head, like the entity was trying to break free. The whispers started again, louder and more insistent. Hold the dagger, Shadowseeker instructed, their voice strained. I took the silver dagger, my hand shaking. The ritual reached its climax, and Shadowseeker nodded at me. Now, destroy the artifact. I stepped forward, raising the dagger. The entity's presence was overwhelming, and for a moment I hesitated. But then I thought of Tom, Lisa, and Eric, and brought the dagger down with all my strength. The skull shattered, releasing a wave of dark energy that knocked us both to the ground. The chamber shook, and a deafening roar filled the air. The entity's form appeared, writhing and screaming, its eyes blazing with fury. But as the ritual took effect, the entity began to dissolve, its form breaking apart like smoke in the wind. The whispers faded, replaced by a profound silence. When it was over, we lay on the ground, gasping for breath. The oppressive feeling was gone, replaced by a strange calm. I looked at Shadowseeker, who gave me a weary smile. You did it, I said. The entity is gone. We made our way back to the surface, the weight of the ordeal lifting with each step. As we emerged into the sunlight, I felt a sense of relief, but also a lingering fear. We had destroyed the artifact, but I still didn't know what had happened to my friends. Shadowseeker assured me that with the entity gone, the connections between the sites would weaken, and my friends might be free to return. But it would take time, and there were no guarantees. I thanked them for their help and returned home, hoping against hope that Tom, Lisa, and Eric would find their way back. It's been a few weeks since then, and I'm still waiting. The nightmares have lessened, and the whispers have stopped. But uh, every now and then, I catch a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye, shadow that seems out of place. I can't shake the feeling that the darkness isn't entirely gone, that it's waiting for the right moment to strike. I've continued my research, determined to find a way to bring my friends back. Maybe they're out there, somewhere between worlds, waiting for me to find them. Or maybe the entity left a part of itself behind, lurking in the shadows, ready to drag me back into the nightmare. I don't know what the future holds, but I can't give up. Not now. Not after everything we've been through. I'll keep searching, keep fighting, until I find the answers I need. Because I can't let the darkness win. Hey everyone, it's taken me a while to write this, but I owe it to you, and to myself, to finish the story. Here's the final part. Weeks turned into months and my search for answers continued. The whispers had stopped, and the nightmares had lessened, but the sense of unease never left me. I couldn't shake the feeling that the darkness was still out there, waiting for the right moment to strike. And my friends, Tom, Lisa, and Eric, were still missing. I couldn't give up on them. One evening, 
As I was going through some old notes, my phone rang. It was a number I didn't recognize. Hesitantly, I answered. Jake, it's Eric. My heart skipped a beat. Eric, is it really you? Yeah, man, it's me. I... I don't know what happened. One minute I was in that bunker, and the next... I woke up in a hospital, miles away. They said I was found wandering in the woods, confused and dehydrated. Tears filled my eyes. Eric, thank God. Are Tom and Lisa with you? There was a pause. No, they're still missing, but I think I know how to find them. Eric had spent weeks recovering, piecing together fragments of memories and researching everything he could about the entities and the artifacts. He had come to believe that the artifacts didn't just bind the entities, they also acted as gateways to other dimensions. Destroying the artifact weakened the entity, but it also disrupted the gateway, leaving Tom and Lisa trapped between worlds. We need to go back, Eric said. We need to find a way to reopen the gateway and bring them back. The thought of returning to that place filled me with dread, but I knew he was right. We couldn't leave Tom and Lisa behind. We agreed to meet at Shadow Seeker's place, hoping they would have more answers. Shadow Seeker was surprised, but relieved to see Eric. We explained our theory, and they nodded thoughtfully. It makes sense, they said. I've heard of similar cases where people were trapped between dimensions. If we can find a way to stabilize the gateway, we might be able to bring them back. The three of us spent days preparing for the journey. Shadow Seeker provided us with more tools, runes for protection, a new ritual to stabilize the gateway, and a mirror said to reflect the true nature of things. We set off, determined to finish what we had started. The hike to the bunker was grueling, but having Eric by my side gave me strength. When we reached the hatch, we found it partially open, as if inviting us in. We descended into the darkness, the oppressive air wrapping around us like a shroud. The bunker seemed different this time, the walls more decayed, the symbols more twisted. We made our way to the circular chamber, the center of the disturbance. The pedestal was still broken, the remains of the skull scattered across the floor. We set up the ritual, placing the mirror in the center of the room. As Shadow Seeker began chanting, the air grew thick with energy. The walls vibrated and the ground shook. The gateway began to flicker, a swirling vortex of light and shadow. Focus on the mirror, Shadow Seeker shouted. It will show us the way. I stared into the mirror, my heart pounding. At first, I saw only my reflection distorted and twisted, but then the image shifted, revealing a dark, shadowy landscape. In the distance I saw two figures, Tom and Lisa. They looked lost and afraid, their forms flickering like candle flames. Tom, Lisa, I screamed, we're here, we're going to get you out. Their eyes locked on mine, a glimmer of hope in their expressions. Shadow Seeker continued chanting, their voice growing louder, more insistent. The gateway stabilized, and the figures of Tom and Lisa grew clearer. Now, Jake, reach out to them, Shadow Seeker commanded. I extended my hand toward the mirror, feeling a strange resistance, as if pushing through thick mud. My fingers touched the cold surface, and I felt a jolt of energy. Tom and Lisa reached out, their hands meeting mine through the glass. With a final powerful chant, Shadow Seeker completed the ritual. The mirror shattered, releasing a blinding light. I felt myself being pulled back, and then everything went dark. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on the floor of the chamber, 
Eric and Shadowseeker were beside me, looking exhausted but triumphant. I turned my head and saw Tom and Lisa, unconscious but breathing. Tears of relief filled my eyes. We carried Tom and Lisa out of the bunker, the oppressive atmosphere lifting with each step. The hike back to the car felt surreal, the weight of our ordeal slowly lifting. When we finally reached civilization, we took Tom and Lisa to the hospital. They recovered quickly, with no memory of what had happened to them. In the weeks that followed, we tried to piece our lives back together. The whispers were gone, and the nightmares had ceased. We had faced the darkness and survived. But the experience had changed us all. Tom and Lisa decided to move away, wanting to start fresh somewhere far from the memories of the bunker. Eric continued his research, determined to understand more about the entities and the artifacts. As for me, I stayed in touch with Shadowseeker, learning everything I could about the supernatural and how to protect myself and others from it. I still have the mirror, or what's left of it. Its shards are a reminder of what we went through and the power of the darkness we faced. I keep it in a box, along with the ritual book and the runes, just in case. I know that darkness is still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. But now, I'm prepared. And if it ever comes for me again, I'll be ready. Thank you for reading my story. Stay safe, and always be wary of what you might awaken in the dark corners of the world. I found a camera in the woods. What I saw will haunt me for life. Hey everyone, I'm not sure if I'm doing this right, but I just need to get this off my chest. Something happened to me a few months ago, and I haven't been able to shake it. I've tried talking to friends and family, but they just think I'm messing with them or exaggerating. So. Here I am, sharing this with the strangers on the internet, hoping someone will believe me, or at least understand. It all started on a Saturday afternoon. I live in a small town surrounded by dense woods. Growing up here, the forest was always a part of my life. I'd go hiking, camping, and just exploring whenever I could. It was my way of escaping the mundane routine of small town life. That day, I decided to take a walk along a trail I hadn't been on in years. It was an old path, overgrown and rarely used. I figured it would be a nice change of scenery. The sun was high, casting dappled shadows through the trees. The air was cool and smelled of pine and earth. It felt good to be out there, away from everything. After walking for about an hour, I stumbled upon something that caught my eye. It was a small, old-school camcorder, partially hidden under a pile of leaves. It looked like it had been there for a while, but it was in surprisingly good condition. Curiosity got the best of me, and I picked it up. It was heavier than I expected. I brushed off the dirt and leaves and noticed there was a tape inside. My heart started to race what could be on it. Without thinking too much, I decided to take it home and find out. When I got back to my house, I realized I didn't have anything to play the tape on. Luckily, my neighbor, Mr. Jenkins, is a bit of a tech hoarder. He's got all sorts of old gadgets and devices. I went over to his place, and after a bit of convincing, he let me borrow an old VH chess player that could connect to my TV. Back home, I set everything up in my living room. I was practically shaking with anticipation. I popped the tape into the player and pressed play. The screen flickered, and for a moment there was only static. Then an image slowly came into focus. It was a girl, probably in her early twenties. 
She looked scared, her eyes darting around as if she was searching for something or someone. The camera was shaky, the picture occasionally blurring as it moved. She was in the woods, similar to the ones I had found the camera in. She was whispering something, but I couldn't make it out at first. I turned up the volume and leaned in closer. I don't know where I am. I don't know who's doing this. If anyone finds this, please help me. Her voice sent chills down my spine. It was filled with desperation and fear. The camera panned around, showing the dense forest surrounding her. Suddenly, there was a rustling sound off screen. She froze, her eyes wide with terror. The camera whipped around, but there was nothing there, just trees and shadows. She started running, the camera bouncing wildly as she moved. The footage was disorienting, but I could hear her heavy breathing and the crunch of leaves underfoot. She kept glancing over her shoulder, her face pale and frantic. It felt like I was right there with her, feeling her fear, her panic. Then she stumbled and fell. The camera hit the ground, the picture going black for a moment before flickering back on. She was lying there, sobbing, dirt and leaves clinging to her clothes. She looked directly into the camera, her eyes pleading. I don't want to die. My heart was pounding in my chest. I wanted to reach through the screen and help her but there was nothing I could do. The camera stayed on her for a few moments longer, then abruptly cut to static. I sat there, stunned. What had I just seen? Who was she? What had happened to her? I rewound the tape and watched it again, trying to catch any details I might have missed, but it was the same. The same fear, the same desperation. I couldn't get her face out of my mind. I had to know more. I decided to go back to the spot where I found the camera, hoping to find some clues. The next morning, I packed a bag with some supplies and headed out. When I reached the spot, I started searching the area more thoroughly. I wandered deeper into the woods, calling out, hoping someone would hear me. Hours passed and I found nothing. I was about to give up when I noticed something odd. There was a small, worn path leading off the main trail. It was barely visible, overgrown with weeds and branches. I decided to follow it. The path twisted and turned, leading me deeper into the forest. The further I went, the more uneasy I felt. It was too quiet, too still. After about 20 minutes, I stumbled upon a clearing, and that's when I saw it, a small cabin, almost hidden among the trees. It looked abandoned, the wood rotting and the windows broken. My heart raced as I approached it. I had a bad feeling about this, but I had to know if it was connected to the girl on the tape. The door creaked as I pushed it open. Inside. It was dark and musty. The air was thick with dust, and the floor was covered in leaves and debris. I pulled out my flashlight and started exploring. The place was empty, just a single room with a broken down bed and a table covered in old newspapers. As I was about to leave, something caught my eye. There was a trap door in the corner, partially hidden under a pile of rags. I hesitated, my hand hovering over the latch. Part of me wanted to turn back, but I couldn't. I had to see what was down there. I pulled open the trap door, revealing a set of stairs leading into darkness. Taking a deep breath, I descended. The air grew colder with each step, and the smell of damp earth filled my nostrils. At the bottom, I found myself in a small, cramped cellar. The walls were lined with shelves, filled with jars and bottles, their contents long since spoiled. In the center of the room was a large wooden table, and on that table there were chains, 
stained with something dark and dried. My stomach churned. I turned to leave, but something caught my eye. There was another camera, identical to the one I had found. It was sitting on a shelf, almost as if it had been placed there deliberately. I grabbed it and hurried back up the stairs, my heart pounding in my chest. Back in the clearing, I took a moment to catch my breath. I knew I had to get out of there and see what was on that camera, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I ran back to my house, not stopping until I was safely inside. I connected the new camera to the TV, my hand shaking. I pressed play and the screen flickered to life. What I saw next made my blood run cold. Hey everyone, thanks for all the comments and messages after my first post. It helps to know that people are actually listening. I've been a mess since finding that second camera, but I promised I'd share what I found, so here goes. When I pressed play on the second tape, I didn't know what to expect. The screen flickered for a moment before an image came into focus. It was the same girl from the first tape. She looked even more disheveled, dirt and grime smeared across her face. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying. She was sitting on the floor of the cabin, the camera positioned in front of her. She wasn't alone this time. There was a man standing off to the side, partially in the shadows. He was tall, wearing a dark hoodie that obscured most of his face. His presence made my skin crawl. The girl glanced at him, her body trembling. Please, just let me go, she begged, her voice barely a whisper. The man didn't respond. Instead, he stepped closer, his face coming into the light. I could see now that he was wearing a mask, one of those plain white ones you'd see at a costume store. It was expressionless, almost mocking her fear. He knelt down beside her, his gloved hand reaching out to stroke her hair. She flinched, but didn't move away. The camera zoomed in, focusing on her face. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she stared into the lens. I don't want to die, she whispered again, her voice breaking. The man stood up abruptly, and the camera panned to follow him. He walked over to the table in the corner of the room, the one I had seen during my search. He picked up a large, rusted knife and turned back to her. My heart was pounding so hard, I thought it might burst. I wanted to turn off the tape to stop watching, but I couldn't. I was frozen, my eyes glued to the screen. The girl started to sob, her cries echoing through the cabin. The man moved closer, the knife glinting in the dim light. He knelt down again, this time placing the knife against her throat. Her eyes widened, her breath coming in short, panicked gasps. I won't scream, she said, her voice barely audible. I won't fight. Just please don't hurt me. The man didn't respond. He just pressed the knife harder against her skin. A thin line of blood appeared, running down her neck. She whimpered, but stayed still. Suddenly the camera cut to static. I sat there, stunned, trying to process what I had just seen. My mind was racing, filled with questions and fear. Who was this man? Why was he doing this? And most importantly, what had happened to the girl? I rewound the tape and watched it again, hoping to catch something I had missed. But it was the same. The same horror, the same helplessness. I felt sick to my stomach. I couldn't just sit there and do nothing. I had to find out more. I decided to go back to the cabin, this time more prepared. I packed a bag with supplies, a flashlight, a knife, some food and water. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I had to try. The next morning, I headed out early. The walk to the cabin felt longer this time, my anxiety growing with each step. When I finally reached a clearing, I paused taking a deep breath. The cabin loomed ahead, dark and foreboding. 
I pushed open the door and stepped inside. The musty smell was even stronger this time, and the air felt colder. I made my way over to the trap door and descended into the cellar. The chains on the table were still there, a grim reminder of what I had seen. I started searching the room, looking for anything that might give me a clue. As I was sifting through the shelves, I found a small, leather-bound notebook. It was old and worn, the pages yellowed with age. But I opened it, my hands trembling. The first few pages were filled with scribbled notes and drawings. They were disturbing, crude sketches of people, their faces twisted in pain. The notes were disjointed, almost incoherent. But as I read on, a pattern started to emerge. The notebook belonged to the man in the mask. He had been living out here for years, capturing and torturing people who wandered too close. The entries detailed his methods, his thoughts, his sick fantasies. It was horrifying. I flipped to the last few pages and found an entry that made my blood run cold. It was about the girl. He had written about how he had found her, how he had kept her captive. The last entry was dated a few weeks ago. He wrote about how she had tried to escape, how he had punished her. I felt a surge of anger and fear. I had to do something. I couldn't just leave her out here. I decided to search the area around the cabin, hoping to find some clue about where she might be. I spent hours combing through the woods, calling out her name. Just as I was about to give up, I heard something. It was faint, almost drowned out by the wind. A soft, muffled cry. I followed the sound, my heart pounding in my chest. I came to a small clearing, and that's when I saw it, a makeshift grave. A mound of dirt and rocks. My stomach dropped. I rushed over and started digging, my hands tearing at the earth. What I found confirmed my worst fears. It was her. Her body was bruised and battered. Her eyes staring lifelessly up at the sky. I fell to my knees, overcome with grief and rage. I called the police, my voice shaken, as I told them what I'd found. They arrived quickly, and the scene was soon swarming with officers. They took my statement and started their investigation. The man in the mask was never found. The police searched the cabin and the surrounding woods, but he had vanished. It was like he had never existed. I've been trying to move on, but it's hard. I still see her face when I close my eyes. I still hear her cries in the silence of the night. I don't know if I'll ever be able to forget what I saw what I went through. Part of me wishes I had never found that camera. But another part of me is glad I did. At least now her story is out there. At least now people know what happened to her. That's all for now. I'll update if I find out anything more. Thanks for listening. Hey everyone. It's been a few weeks since my last update. I've been trying to process everything and figure out what to do next. The police investigation didn't turn up much, and it feels like I'm the only one who still cares about what happened to that girl. I've been having nightmares, and every time I close my eyes, I see her face. I hear her voice. I feel like I'm losing my mind, but I can't let this go. A few days ago, something happened that pushed me to keep digging I was out in my backyard trying to clear my head when I noticed a small envelope tucked under my doormat. My heart started racing as I picked it up. There was no return address, just my name written in shaky handwriting. I tore it open and found a single piece of paper inside. It was a map, hand drawn and crudely sketched. It showed the area around the cabin but uh, there was an index marked in a spot I hadn't explored yet. 
Below the map there was a single sentence. The truth is buried deeper. I didn't know what to make of it. Who had left this for me? Was it a trap? Despite my fear, I knew I had to follow the map. I had to know what else was out there. The next morning, I packed my bag and headed out to the woods again. The air was heavy with the promise of rain, and the forest felt even more ominous than before. I followed the map, my heart pounding with every step. After about an hour, I reached the marked spot. It was a small clearing, overgrown with weeds and surrounded by tall, ancient trees. I started to dig, my hands shaking. The earth was damp and heavy, and it took me a while to make any progress. Just as I was about to give up, my shovel hit something solid. I cleared away the dirt and found a wooden box, old and weathered. My hands trembled as I opened it. Inside there were more tapes, a stack of them. My stomach churned at the sight. I didn't want to watch them, but I knew I had to. I packed the tapes into my bag and hurried back home. The weight of what I had found pressing down on me. Back in my living room, I set up the VHS player and inserted the first tape. The screen flickered, and I braced myself for what I was about to see. The footage started, and my blood ran cold. It was the same girl, but this time she wasn't alone. There were others, three of them, two women and a man. All bound and gagged, they were in the same cellar, the same chain no holding them in place. The masked man was there too, his presence as menacing as ever. He moved methodically, his actions deliberate and cruel. He taunted them, his voice low and chilling. You're all mine, he said, his voice muffled by the mask. No one will find you here. No one will save you. The camera focused on each of them in turn, capturing their terror, their hopelessness. I watched in horror as he tortured them. The footage too graphic to describe. The tape ended abruptly, and I felt like I was going to be sick. I couldn't stop there. I had to watch the rest. Each tape was worse than the last, showing the masked man's escalating brutality. He reveled in their pain, taking pleasure in their suffering. It was a nightmare captured on film, a testament to his depravity. As I watched, I noticed something strange. In the background of one of the tapes, there was a calendar on the wall. It was marked with dates, each one circled in red. I paused the tape and looked closer. The dates matched the times when people had gone missing in our town over the past few years. This guy had been doing this for a long time, right under our noses. I called the police again, this time with the new evidence. They took the tapes and promised to investigate further, but I knew it wouldn't be enough. The masked man was still out there, and he needed to be stopped. I started doing my own research, combing through old newspapers and online forums. I found reports of similar disappearances in neighboring towns, all with the same eerie details people vanishing without a trace, their last known locations always near the woods. One night, as I was going through my notes, I heard a noise outside my window. My heart skipped a beat. I crept over and peeked through the curtains. There, standing at the edge of my yard, was a figure. He was tall, wearing a dark hoodie. My blood ran cold. He just stood there, watching me. I wanted to call the police, but I knew he would be gone before they arrived. I grabbed my phone and took a picture, my hands shaking. As the flash went off, he turned and disappeared into the shadows. I called the police anyway, but they didn't find anything. No footprints, 
No sign that anyone had been there. They told me it was probably just my imagination, that I was jumpy because of everything that had happened. But I knew what I saw. He was watching me, and he wanted me to know it. I can't shake the feeling that I'm being followed, that he's always just out of sight. I've started carrying a knife with me everywhere I go, but I don't know if it will be enough. I'm scared, but I can't give up. I have to find him. I have to stop him. That's all I have for now. I'll keep you updated if anything new happens. Thanks for listening. Please be careful out there. Hey, everyone. It's been a while since my last update, and things have taken a turn for the worse. I appreciate all the support and advice I've gotten from you guys. It's helped keep me grounded, but what's happened since I last posted has shaken me to my core. I need to share it, not just for myself, but to warn anyone who might be in danger. After the police dismissed my latest encounter with the masked man, I felt more alone than ever. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. Every noise, every shadow seemed like a threat. I started sleeping with the lights on, my knife always within reach. But despite my fear, I knew I had to keep digging. I couldn't let this monster win. I spent days poring over the tapes in my notes, trying to find any clue that could lead me to the masked man. I scoured the internet, reaching out to anyone who might have information. I even went back to the woods, searching for any hidden clues or signs of his presence. But it seemed like he had vanished into thin air. One night, as I was about to give up hope, I received an email from an anonymous sender. The subject line read, I know where he is. My heart raced as I opened it. The email was short, just a few sentences. I've seen the man you're looking for. He's living in an abandoned house on the outskirts of town. I can show you, but you have to come alone. Meet me at the old gas station at midnight. It felt like a trap, but I couldn't ignore it. This was the first lead I'd had in weeks. I decided to take the risk. I grabbed my knife, some supplies, and headed out, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and determination. The gas station was deserted when I arrived. The flickering neon sign cast eerie shadows across the cracked pavement. I waited, my nerves on edge, every sound making me jump. Just as I was about to give up, a figure emerged from the darkness. It was a man, dressed in a worn leather jacket and jeans. His face was hidden by the brim of his hat. He approached cautiously, his eyes darting around as if he was being watched. You're the one looking for the masked man, he asked, his voice low and gravelly. I nodded, gripping my knife tightly. Who are you? How do you know about him? He sighed, glancing over his shoulder before speaking. I've been following him for a while. I lost someone to him, my sister. I've been trying to find him. Ever since, his words hit me like a punch to the gut. I felt a surge of empathy and anger. Where is he? Can you take me to him? He nodded. I can, but it's dangerous. He's smart, and he's always watching. We have to be careful. We drove in silence, the tension in the car palpable. The man who introduced himself as Jack led me to an old, decrepit house on the edge of town. It was surrounded by overgrown weeds and trees, the windows boarded up, the door hanging off its hinges. This is it, Jack whispered, parking the car a few blocks away. He's inside. I've seen him come and go. My heart raced as we approached the house. It felt like every shadow was watching us, every rustle of leaves a warning. Jack led the way his flashlight cutting through the darkness. We crept up to the front door, which creaked loudly as we pushed it open. 
The inside of the house was even worse than the outside. The air was thick with dust and decay. The floor littered with broken furniture and debris. We moved cautiously, our footsteps echoing through the empty rooms. As we made our way to the basement, the smell of damp earth grew stronger. My pulse quickened with each step. We reached the bottom of the stair and found ourselves in a small, dimly lit room. There was a table in the center, similar to the one I had seen in the cabin. And on that table, there were more chains, more signs of his sick activities. Suddenly, a noise from behind us made us both jump. We turned to see the masked man standing in the doorway, his eyes gleaming with a twist of delight. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his voice sending chills down my spine. Jack lunged at him, but the masked man was quick. He sidestepped and swung a heavy object at Jack, knocking him to the ground. I screamed and rushed to help, but the masked man grabbed me, his grip like iron. Let go of me, I shouted, struggling against him. He laughed, a cold, cruel sound. You're just like the others, so eager to find me, so easy to catch. I fought with everything I had, kicking and scratching. In the struggle, I managed to pull out my knife and stab him in the arm. He roared in pain and released me, clutching his wound. Jack was back on his feet, and together we overpowered the masked man, tying him up with the very chains he had used on his victims. He struggled and cursed, but he was finally at our mercy. We called the police, and this time they took us seriously. They arrived quickly and took the masked man into custody. As they led him away, I felt a strange mix of relief and sorrow. It was over, but the scars would never fully heal. The investigation revealed that the masked man had been responsible for numerous disappearances over the years. His real identity was a shock to everyone. He had been living among us, hiding in plain sight, a seemingly ordinary man with a monstrous secret. I've tried to move on, but it's been hard. The memories still haunt me. The faces of his victims etched into my mind, but at least now, they have some semblance of justice. At least now they can rest in peace. Thank you to everyone who listened, who supported me through this nightmare. I don't know what I would have done without you. Stay safe out there and always be vigilant. You never know what darkness might be lurking just out of sight. That's all for now. If anything else comes up, I'll let you know, but for now, I'm going to try and find some semblance of normalcy again. Take care, everyone. Hey, everyone. I can't believe I'm writing this final part, but I need to share the conclusion of this nightmare. It's taken me a while to process everything, and I hope this brings some closure, not just for me, but for everyone who's been following this story. After the masked man was arrested, the police conducted a thorough investigation. They searched his house and the surrounding area, uncovering a hidden basement filled with more evidence of his crimes. There were more tapes, more notebooks, more sick trophies of his twisted activities. The sheer volume of it was overwhelming. He had been operating for years his list of victims longer than anyone could have imagined. The town was in shock. People who had known him for years couldn't believe what he had done. Friends, neighbors, even his family were horrified. It was like a veil had been lifted, revealing the monster hiding in plain sight. The media descended on our small town turning it into a circus. Reporters hounded everyone for interviews, digging into every aspect of the masked man's life. But amidst the chaos, something good 
came out of it. The families of the victims finally got some answers. They got the closure they had been denied for so long. And for me, that was the most important thing. Knowing that those families could start to heal gave me a sense of peace. Jack and I stayed in touch. We became close, bonded by our shared trauma. We attended the trial together, supporting each other as we watched the masked man face justice. The trial was long and harrowing. The details of his crimes laid bare for everyone to see. He showed no remorse, no emotion. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It wasn't enough to erase the pain he had caused, but it was something. After the trial, I decided I needed a fresh start. The town held too many dark memories, too many reminders of what had happened. I sold my house and moved to a new city far away from the woods and the cabin. It was hard to leave behind everything I knew, but it was necessary for my sanity. Jack did the same. He moved to a different state, hoping to find some peace. We promised to stay in touch, and we have. We check in on each other regularly, sharing updates on our new lives. It helps to have someone who understands, someone who went through it all with me. The nightmares still come sometimes. I still see the girl's face, still hear her cries, but I'm learning to live with it. I've started seeing a therapist, working through the trauma. It's a slow process, but I'm making progress. I'm trying to rebuild my life to find some sense of normalcy again. One thing that's helped is writing. I've started keeping a journal, documenting my thoughts and feelings. It's therapeutic, a way to process everything that's happened. I've even thought about turning this story into a book, sharing it with a wider audience. Maybe it can help others who've been through similar experiences. As I write this final part, I want to thank everyone who's been there for me. Your support, your encouragement, it's meant the world to me. I couldn't have gotten through this without you. This community has been a lifeline, a source of strength in my darkest moments. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm hopeful. I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, starting to believe that things can get better. It won't be easy, but I'm determined to move forward. If there's one thing I've learned from all of this, it's that we can't let fear control us. We have to face our demons, confront the darkness, and fight for the light. No matter how hard it gets, we have to keep going, so thank you, everyone, for listening, for believing in me. This isn't the end, just a new beginning. Stay safe and always be vigilant. You never know what's lurking in the shadows, but together we can face anything. Take care and goodbye for now.